Excellent. Thanks for the help from the audience. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Kelly McJanet and I am the CEO of a not-for-profit organisation called Food Ladder. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of this land and their elders past and present and thank them for welcoming me onto this land. It's wonderful to be back, uh, the 15th annual uh, National Rural Health Conference and to be speaking on the topic of investing in early childhood nutrition to combat entrenched poverty in rural Australia. And while our impacts and outcomes at Food Ladder have grown since I spoke two years ago at the conference in Cairns, something else has changed and that is that I recently became a mother. This topic is even more pertinent to me. In my professional capacity as the CEO of Food Ladder, I speak often and frequently about the importance of early childhood nutrition. But in having my own baby and being faced with the immense responsibility and reality of parenthood, where one's sole motivation in life becomes to raise your child to be healthy and to have the best chance at every success in life, Never has it been more alarming to me that so many Australian mothers do not have access to the, f to the critically necessary healthy food that underpins their nutrition and the nutrition of their child. In a first world country like Australia, this issue simply should not continue to plague women and their babies. My husband and I are forever grateful to have a thriving, bouncy five-month-old boy, Henry, and I feel my work as a result has never made more sense or had greater purpose. Founded in 2008, Food Ladder is the world's first not-for-profit organisation to use hydroponic and environmentally sustainable technologies to create food and economic security for communities otherwise reliant on aid and affected by poverty. Simply, we use custom-designed commercial food growing systems to provide nutrient-rich produce around the world, from rural towns in India and Uganda to the most remote parts of, Northern, of the Northern Territory in Australia, providing food security, education, training, employment, and more for children and adults. It's a short video. This is in Catherine in the Northern Territory. Every day around the world, we have children of all ages visiting food ladder systems. Some are malnourished and have never seen or heard of some of the fruit and vegetables that we grow. Some have regular meals, but it's unhealthy and processed food because in many remote communities, as we know, this is all communities can afford or have access to. Over the last few months in preparation for this conference, I took the time to engage with some of the teachers specifically about some of the outcomes that they have seen 
in the last couple of months in food ladder systems. One teacher in India told me how prior to having a food ladder system on site, many of her st students struggled to learn because their diet had led to poor health and in turn, poor attendance and retention rates at their schools. However, as a result of implementing the system, the children were now eating fresh produce on a daily basis and learning how to grow and prepare healthy meals. On the other side of town, another teacher in India told me how many of his students, who previously had no knowledge of how to grow and harvest plants, now grow their own vegetables at home. These children are actually teaching their families as well the invaluable skill of nutrition, which is passed down through generations. This was echoed by a teacher in the Northern Territory who shared how it wasn't only the students who were learning about the importance of making good food choices, but their families as well, with the schools now offering school and holiday programs to local mothers, providing education and training in nutrition, horticulture and fresh fruit and vegetables to take home to the rest of the family. This is in Uganda. Regardless of where they call home, be it in the slums of India or in remote indigenous communities in Australia's north, all of these children share three fundamental challenges. Ill health, little education, and few future employment prospects. At Food Ladder, we know that these issues often stem from one thing, and that is poor nutrition during childhood. It's often said that a child's future is decided in their first thousand days, from conception to the child's second birthday. During this time, appropriate nutrition is pivotal, with international research finding children with a healthy diet are up to 10 times more likely to overcome life-threatening childhood diseases. They go on to earn 21% more in wages, they complete 4.6 more grades at school, and they are more likely, as adults, to have healthier families. It is therefore paramount that parents particularly mothers and children are fed healthy food and taught about nutrition from an early age. Not only does it mean that they form healthy habits for life, but they pass these habits down to their children and their children's children. Malnutrition is an intergenerational problem. It's undeniable that poor nutrition also starts, stunts a nation's economic growth due to higher health care costs, early mortality, and lack of concentration and advancement at school. This not only happens in developing nations, but in Australia, as we know, most evidently in remote Indigenous communities, where 30.8% of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are unable to buy food due to a lack of funds and produce availability. This is exactly what we aim to address. Radical change is required across the entire food supply chain to shift communities away from a freighted, expensive and at times rotten produce to locally grown, affordable and local and fresh alternatives. However, addressing food insecurity both here and abroad is no new notion. In rural Australia, governments and, and organisations have been trying to tackle the disparity between health and wellbeing of Indigenous communities and their city counterparts for years. In fact, the disparity is so great that the United Nations frequently holds Australia to account on the world stage, with a recent report finding the basic needs of Indigenous Australians, such as adequate housing, safe drinking water and sanitation, and access to education are not being met. And the, the health of Indigenous communities not only compares disfavourably to other first world nations, but actually compares worse in some respects when compared with third world nations. Only last month, this year's Closing the Gap report was released, once again showing minimal progress has been ma made towards reducing Indigenous disadvantage. The report revealed most targets were still off track, with only two of seven showing positive progress, that being early, uh, sorry, year 12 attainment and early childhood nutrition. So how to address these issues when so many responses have failed? For us at Food Ladder, we believe it's about working in partnership with like-minded, community-controlled Indigenous organisations, the people on the ground who know what communities want. With this in mind, Food Ladder addresses the key design failures of many other food security and nutrition initiatives by using a community-led holistic approach, addressing both the supply of and the demand for nutritious food. The Food Ladder system is a capability-building microeconomic development model 
that pl placing outcomes creation in community hands. So how does it work exactly? First, we work with communities who want us and we undertake community consultations with local leaders, teachers, employers, health providers to ensure everybody agrees on the project's vision, mission and method of implementation. Community, community buy-in is key. As a not-for-profit organisation, we do not seek to own assets, but rather each social enterprise is owned and governed by the local community with full support and guidance from our team. As a result, we build solid and robust partnerships with local motivated partner organisations who own the life-supporting infrastructure and support them with training and mentoring until they're able to operate the business independently. Our food ladder system in Ramanginning, an Indigenous community in East Arnhem Land, is a prime example. Cut off from neighbouring communities for much of the year during, due to monsoons, Ramanginning has limited access to fresh and nutrient-dense produce. All food is shipped in at great expense, travelling up for up to three weeks on over 3,000 kilometres in many cases, limiting it to a two-day shelf life once it actually arrives in the community. For this reason, we join forces with ALPA uh, to create a partnership to address the issue. Through the implementation of a food ladder system, one of the world's longest freight routes became the shortest. We've harvested produce, it's, produce is harvested and sold in the same day and at significantly lower cost. As a result, nutritionists recorded a 5% increase in the sale and consumption of fruit and vegetables in the first six months of the food ladder system being in operation. It's an increase that's never before been seen in the community. As the saying goes, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. Since its inception, Food Ladder has benefited 31,500 individuals, from horticulture classes to cooking and nutrition workshops. We've fed over 6,000 and we've created 600 jobs. Importantly, our sustainable business model creates micro-economies in remote communities, generating long-term solutions and real change. Today in Catherine in the Northern Territory, the system that you saw previously, is feeding hundreds of Indigenous people who are escaping Cyclone Trevor. Today alone we handed out 60 kilos of fresh produce picked, uh, including Indigenous bush foods that have been grown in the system to ensure these people do not go hungry. We have a long way to go in Australia to reduce morbidity and mortality, to boost attendance and retention rates at school, and in turn to lead to improved job prospects and employment. As a CEO of Food Ladder and as a mother, I believe we need to act quickly and to invest in early childhood nutrition before its impact adversely affects yet another generation of Australians. We know without doubt that malnutrition is at the core of impoverished communities and at Food Ladder we feel we have a solution. Thanks. I think I'm just inside the time, so if anyone has any questions, great. I'd be very happy to answer. Yes. Has the sea tax problem around Catherine been an issue? Um, that's a very good question. Um, for anyone who isn't isn't aware, there has um, been uh, an issue with Catherine's water. Uh, we have tanks, water tanks, so we harvest rainwater during the monsoon and we also have solar panels. So the whole point of Food Ladder is that, you know, the initial dream um, was, that I had was you could literally put one of these anywhere in the world and it's completely self-sufficient and we are, are basically that. Um, one of the great things about hydroponics is it obviously has a very negative connotation that, um, as growing marijuana, which we have to explain away, we do not... Um, to not grow marijuana in these hydroponic systems, but certainly the hydroponics being based a water-based system actually makes it more economical on water. So if you think of traditional farming out in plain air under the sun, and certainly in places like Catherine, you have huge amounts of evaporation, which makes the requirement to water the food almost unfeasible, uh, especially when you obviously have drought and so forth. You can't really 
make that, make that argument. The fact that all of this water is reticulated or it's in a, what we call a closed loop system, so nothing is wasted and the water is then purified and, and sent back into the same, into the same system. So I, I should add that we haven't recreated the wheel here, right? Like greenhouses, hydroponics, this kind of technology has been around in commercial farming, you know, for as long as commercial farming uh, has, been, has been happening with long distribution and freight. In Ethiopia, for example, uh, they grow the majority of Holland's tulips in hydroponic greenhouses, and we know the, the state of affairs around food security in Ethiopia. The issue has been that this infrastructure has never been used to address uh, malnutrition. And it just seemed absurd to us when we have such a, us at Food Ladder, we have such an expensive, massive challenge that is wiping out swathes of indigenous and non-indigenous people, that we aren't investing those funds at the beginning of the problem with infrastructure that can address the issue. So it's really, I suppose, a preventative measure if you think of it along kind of, you know, in, in terms of health. Yep, up back. You can call out, I can probably hear. Yeah, so in Australia, um, no community has paid for a system. So we have had uh, partnerships with Aboriginal organisations, um, but a lot of the infrastructure in remote Australia has been funded by uh, the federal government. Um, and that is just for the, that is just for the physical, um, the physical infrastructure. I suppose the, the cost and the buy-in for community it comes out of the long community consultation that we do in the front end, which is about 12 months worth of community consultation. And that is understanding that, you know, ultimately it is the community that will be running the system and taking on responsibility for it. So it's a uh, very uh, important commitment from them to operate it uh, and, and govern it. Uh, and we make sure that there's buy-in across the whole community. Um, Having said that, internationally, we are, we are working on a, micro, a um, microfinance scheme where the infrastructure is much, much cheaper. Um, and, you know, I mean, and, uh, and, and, and that, would be a different, that would be a different model. So we're exploring lots of ways to scale. But certainly in Australia, in the communities that we're working with, as I mentioned before, you know, there are cyclones and floods and monsoons and very extreme weather. So uh, these, these things are very, very robust and as a result expensive. So to date, it, we've, been, we've had funding from the government for that. But I would add that um, we're constantly expanding and we get approached by many remote communities. And if in your travels there are communities that you work with that you believe would benefit from Food Ladder, we would invite you uh, in partnership with those communities to come forward because that's why we exist. We want to help. Yes. Yeah, they have very, very long, like well over 20 years. Um, and certainly because these all run as businesses, so they all create a little bit of income. That all that money is for the community, so it goes back into the community. So we work with them, the community that is, to understand what, it, what, it, what is the amount of money that they need to put aside for jobs, you know, seed replenishment and, you know, upkeep of the system and then what is kind of a straight profit. Um, to be honest, the, um, this is mostly repurposed plastic anyway, so um, there isn't, there's really not much waste. So we're, we're pretty light, light touch, even though they look like a big plastic uh, structure um, environmentally. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone.